come back with yet another review of Ancient Apocalypse. If you haven't seen my previous four reviews of the Netflix show yet, I highly recommend watching them first before you start with this one. I've actually put them in their own dedicated playlist, so it's easier for you to find them. And I'll put the playlist in the upper right corner for you to click. And that way you can start watching the first four episodes if you haven't already. My name is Kaylee, and this is my response to Ancient Apocalypse episode Five, Legacy of the Sages. The episode starts off with Graham explaining that our electricity and our 24-7 way of life with our lights has cut us off from the night sky, which was the most greatest show on earth for the people living in ancient times. I actually couldn't agree more with him on this. Our light pollution makes it nearly impossible for us to see the stars in their full glory. Only a few places on Earth where there isn't much light pollution can we still see the Milky Way in all its glory. He says that the ancient structures are pointing our attention to the heavens, but he wonders if it's more than that. He says that the ancient temples and pyramids all around the world connect sky to ground with precise alignments to the sun, moon and stars. Although, to be completely honest with you, most of these alignments aren't actually precise, which he is aware of. Yes, Newgrange in Ireland is created with the perfect alignment to the winter solstice sunrise. The light of the sun illuminates the inner chamber through the 19 meter or 62 feet long passageway. And there are more burial mounds in Ireland that have an alignment with the equinoxes or even to the moon. But not all these ancient structures have alignments like these. Graham wonders if the ancient builders try to warn us to pay close attention to the heavens. He travels to Turkey near San Liorfa, the northeastern part of the Fertile Crescent. He explains that in the Fertile Crescent, the Sumerians are credited with the birth of civilization, but that this view of history cries out to be rewritten. But the question here is, what makes a civilization? What is needed for a culture of people to become a civilization? So when you Google what makes a civilization, you get results from a number of different websites. But to be honest, the overall gist remains the same. So historians have categorized a civilization as the following. When the rise of agriculture and trade allowed people to have a surplus and economic stability, which led to large population centers with monumental architecture and unique art styles, shared communication strategies, systems for administering territories, a complex division of labor and the division of people into social and economic classes. A form of writing system or numeric system is needed for a civilization, like the Incas who didn't actually have a writing system, but they did have a quipu system for accounting, which allowed the government to conduct consensuses of its population and production. The oldest writing system is developed in Mesopotamia, in Sumer, and it's called cuneiform. Therefore, the Sumerians are credited with the birth of civilization. Unless we find an older writing system or numeric system elsewhere, the birth of civilization according to the categorization appointed by historians will remain in Sumer. Of course, historians could one day change this categorization, which then changes the location and age of the birth of civilization. But at the same time, this might never happen. This is also the reason why there is a distinct difference between a culture and a civilization when we talk about people living in ancient times. Ancient cultures predate ancient civilizations. They go all the way back to the Middle Paleolithic, which started around 43,000 years ago. The Mousterian stone tool industry, which first developed around 160,000 years ago, is credited mostly to the Neanderthals in Europe and earliest anatomically modern humans in North Africa and West Asia. And this led to the Aurignacian culture around 43,000 years ago. But the Australian Aboriginal culture is actually thought to predate this, dating back to more than 65,000 years ago and maybe even further. So to clarify, ancient cultures have lived in groups 
and created structures like the ones in Turkey, for instance Gobekli Tepe and the other Tastapeller sites. But they are not perceived as a civilization because they lack certain characteristics that historians have appointed to a civilization. So back to Turkey. In 1963, the archaeological site of Gobekli Tepe was first noted in a survey, although back then American archaeologist Peter Benedict mistook the top parts of the T-shaped pillars as grave markers, possibly because the field had been agriculturally cultivated for such a long time and many stones had been moved and placed in clearance piles. So in 1994, German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt decided to re-examine the location after he had been working on the Valley Cori and was wondering if similar sites existed in the area. This led to the discovery of one of the earliest man-made structures on Earth, Gobekli Tepe. According to Graham, the discovery of Gobekli Tepe requires us to abandon all our prejudices about our Stone Age ancestors. I wonder, which prejudices? Because historians all agree that the people who lived during the Stone Age were far more sophisticated than previously thought. And when I say previously thought, I mean up until the early 90s. And the archaeologists who believed those prejudices back in the day are no longer working in the field or have drastically changed their perspective due to new discoveries made in the past 30 years. We now know that surgical amputation was even conducted 31,000 years ago. I mean, that really shows their level of skill, intelligence, sophistication, you name it. Maybe Graham is convinced that historians still have prejudices against people living during the Stone Age. But at the same time, that might just be his personal bias. So I looked at the episode and the episode very clearly shows the canopy. And I'm happy that the canopy that's constructed above Gobekli Tepe to protect it from the elements is shown in the series. No, they aren't pretty, but they are a necessary evil to protect these incredible structures. After my trip to Malta, I've come to respect these canopies. Without them, these structures would erode and disintegrate much faster. Graham says that based on everything we've been taught about prehistory, Gobekli Tepe shouldn't exist. I think he's solely looking on what he was taught about prehistory when he was still in school. Which, not to be mean or anything, was quite a long time ago, as he was born in 1950, and not even remotely the same as what people learn in school nowadays. Archaeology and history have evolved over time, and it will keep evolving and rewriting history with new discoveries. So to assume that these younger generations are taught the exact same things about prehistory is quite outlandish. <sighs> Sorry. But back to the episode, Graham says that archaeologists accept that Gobekli Tepe dates back to approximately 11,600 years ago, making this the oldest acknowledged monumental structure on Earth, according to Graham. But if I'm gonna be honest, Gobekli Tepe isn't actually the oldest monumental structure on Earth. <laughs> Bumkuklu Tarla in Turkey is nearly a thousand years older, dating back to 12,500 years ago. Excavations at Bunkuklu Tarla have been ongoing since 2012, and as time goes on, more information is uncovered. So Graham says that Gobekli Tepe is a highly sophisticated and highly advanced megalithic site, and then feels the need to say it's about 7,000 years older than Stonehenge and the Giza pyramids. Which would actually mean that he agrees that the pyramids were built by the ancient Egyptians. Why else would he feel the need to include the pyramids in that sentence? I wondered. He seems to use Gobekli Tepe as his smoking gun, so to speak. Although for historians and archaeologists, Gobekli Tepe was the find that they were looking for, as they always want to try and push back the timeline with new discoveries. Gobekli Tepe was built around the same time the last Ice Age ended, when we entered the Holocene, which is the current geological epoch. Gobekli Tepe is only one of the, in total, 12 Tas Tepeler sites in Turkey, located on the hilltops of southeastern Turkey, in the northeast of what once was the Fertile Crescent. And it's very important to note that only a fraction of Gobekli Tepe is excavated. Estimations range around 5% to be more precise here. 
which means that all the splendor that we've seen at Gobekli Tepe thus far only has been about 5% of its entire extent, which means that 95% is still waiting to be uncovered. Holy hell, that's a lot. He says that the locals at the end of the last ice age were supposed to be unsophisticated hunter-gatherers living in mud huts. I honestly don't know where he got this ancient notion from. It must be from the textbooks that he used to read in school when he was a little boy because this is so far removed from what historians and archaeologists know about the end of the last ice age and the people inhabiting this area. This is quite a preposterous thing to say. He tries to gain sympathy here, but all he does, in my opinion, is make himself look old and honestly quite bad. He then goes on to ask if the people living in the area of Gobekli Tepe at the end of the last ice age weren't advanced enough to create it. Then who did and why? The episode then shows another 3D render, this time of what Gobekli Tepe could have looked like back in its prime, although of course they only show the excavated part which is only about 5% of the size of this massive structure. Beyond its immense size, Gobekli Tepe is also well known for its intricate carvings. Numerous animals are depicted here on the pillars. The enclosures here at Gobekli Tepe weren't built around the same time. In fact, there is about 1100 years between the oldest and the youngest enclosures that have been excavated so far. It's unknown if the unexcavated 95% of Gobekli Tepe is older, if it's created between those 1100 years or if it's even younger than the current excavated area, we simply don't know because it's not excavated, it's not researched, it might be older, it might be younger, we don't know. Graham focuses on the fact that Enclosure D is the oldest and largest and most intricately decorated of the four excavated enclosures. He then repeats an old narrative that's been going around in the alternative history community for a very long time. That somehow the oldest is the best and as time went on they lost the skill set to build these grand things because the younger creations are less sophisticated and smaller. Out of the blue incredible things were created and this all points to his ancient advanced civilization that eventually got lost and their skill set was lost with them and we haven't been able to recreate their grand masterpieces. But here at Gobekli Tepe, 95% is still unexcavated and therefore it's unknown if Enclosure D is in fact the oldest. There could be even older enclosures that show the gradual increase of skill. And maybe as time went on, they didn't want to create such large enclosures anymore and felt like a smaller one would fit their needs best? Look at our phones! We used to have these massive bricks and now we have these slim, tiny phones <laughs> with internet and everything. I mean, come on, not everything has to get bigger as time goes by. It's preposterous. He then hypothesizes about these Stone Age hunter-gatherers building with megaliths who succeeded so brilliantly at their very first attempt. Again, as I have said a few times now, only 5% of Gobekli Tepe is excavated, 95% is still below the soil and therefore it cannot be said with certainty that Enclosure D is the oldest. And this means that this most likely wasn't their actual first attempt and they have created other enclosures or structures before they started the work on Enclosure D at Gobekli Tepe. Again, look at Bunku Klutarla. It's a thousand years older. It's a little less sophisticated. You can actually show the gradual increase of skill when looking at these two sites. He then says it's time to consider the possibility that the great megalithic enclosures weren't some miraculous overnight invention of hunter-gatherers, but were a legacy from a previously lost civilization of prehistory. And he says that mainstream archaeologists find this notion almost offensive. Well, honestly, it is a preposterous notion, as I have explained a multitude of times now in the span of just a few minutes that the knowledge we have about Gobekli Tepe is about as much as a needle in a haystack. We barely know anything because the majority is still unexcavated. Therefore, unknown what is the oldest and first creation here. 
So to hypothesize that Enclosure D is the very oldest and that the very first attempt to create anything here succeeded brilliantly and therefore is the smoking gun evidence for his lost ancient advanced civilization from Atlantis is just ridiculous. At this point of watching the show, I am starting to get a bit annoyed at how quickly Graham jumps to conclusions and how much I have to research while writing my review videos. The insane amount of information he is leaving out on purpose is staggering and he is willfully sharing misinformation while leaving out the massive amounts of researched information to support his theory about his ancient lost advanced civilization. And it's not only to support his one theory, but at the same time it paints the scholars, the academic scholars who have worked relentlessly on sites like Gobekli Tepe in a bad light, to make them look like the bad guys because that is what's going to sell more books or something. Sorry, I really got very annoyed here. It's too obvious for me what he's doing and at this point of watching the show, I honestly couldn't ignore it any longer. Yes, I'm trying to make fair review videos, but at the same time, if only he had made a fair show. He does indeed mention the geophysical survey that was conducted in 2003 that showed at least nine hectares of the hill have enclosures inside of them with pillars, which aren't excavated. But he then goes back to how it's impossible for hunter-gatherers with no prior skill, no prior knowledge, no background in working with stone to create all of this, even though he just showed the viewer that it's very likely, if everything is underground, is excavated, that we see the gradual improvement of the site, that we see the gradual improvement of their skills. So of course, because it's impossible in his mind for hunter-gatherers to have created Gobekli Tepe, it must have been created by his lost ancient advanced civilization who transferred their technology, their skills, their knowledge to the hunter-gatherers in the area. And people wonder why archaeologists get a bit pissy whenever he mentions his fabled lost ancient advanced civilization. He is telling the viewer that the people in the area weren't capable but that his fabled civilization was, although no one ever questions the Romans, right? I wonder why. But back to the episode, he then tells the viewer of another site in the area that's been under excavation since 2019, Karahan Tepe, another one of the Tastapeller sites. He mentions how the Turkish authorities have never allowed any outside cameras to film at this site until Graham and his team came along. Although I know of some YouTubers who have filmed there with drones and posted their footage online without a problem after having asked permission. I believe that the biggest reason for Turkish authorities to not let anyone just film there without approval has to do with the fact that the excavations at this site are still ongoing. And whenever they uncover something new, it first needs to be researched properly before being put online for the world to see. It is important that we remember that archaeological excavations are conducted in a scientific manner. Therefore, nothing can get published before proper research has been done. Professor Karul says that Karahan Tepe was created most likely around the same time as Gobekli Tepe. Although there is a possibility that Karahan Tepe actually predates Gobekli Tepe. Of course, as you can imagine, the two sites are quite different, even though they have some overlapping features. For instance, Karahan Tepe is partially carved out of the bedrock, while still having T-shaped pillars. It seems that Karahan Tepe was a gathering space, some say ritualistic gathering space. Graham focuses on the carvings found at Karahan Tepe and he mentions robed figures that are depicted here and how he thinks that they represent the site's true architects. A claim I honestly find very unnecessary in the scope of the incredible site that he is visiting. The professor takes Graham into the enclosure with the phalluses carved out of the bedrock. I actually mentioned this part of Karahan Tepe in a video I created about ancient depictions of phalluses. Yeah, I can be a bit of a jokester, even though I looked at real history. But yeah, that video I'll put that as a card and in the description down below. 
So this chamber is about two meters deep and there is a channel carved leading into it on one side, as if water was able to fill this space. Graham actually mentions the possibility of blood having flowed through the channel into the chamber, which of course is quite likely. I myself have often joked and said that this part of Karahan Tepe is the bathhouse of the brothel. Just kidding, of course, all in good fun. Like I said, I'm a bit of a jokester sometimes. But you know, back to the real stuff and not my childish jokes, I'm sorry. The strange head carving out of the rock in the chamber of the phallic pillars is quite, you know, strange. The professor explains how the archaeologists haven't found evidence of farming dating back to the creation of Gobekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe nearby, that the creators of these sites were definitely still hunter-gatherers. So according to this professor, settlement came before agriculture, because they created settlements, then they started to produce a different way of life, which included agriculture. Anatolian farmers are direct descendants of Anatolian hunter gatherers who lived in the area 15,000 years ago. 11,000 years ago, the first farmers emerged in the Fertile Crescent, which includes the area of Gobekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe and all the other Tastapeller sites, which means that the creators of these sites could very well have been part of these early farmers. They most likely practiced a very rudimentary form of agriculture, and it's possible that they didn't settle too close around the Tastapeller sites, maybe for ritualistic or religious reasons. It's possible. According to Graham, there is no proof of agriculture at Gobekli Tepe when it was built, but as soon as it was created, agriculture started to appear all around it. So for him, what the evidence speaks to is very clear, as he so cleverly said it in the episode. It's a transfer of technology. He says that people who already knew how to create megaliths and build megalithic sites uh, came to Gobekli Tepe that they already had the knowledge of agriculture and that they used that to mobilize a local community to organize them and to introduce them to agriculture. We all know how that goes. When a different civilization comes in to mobilize a local community to organize them and to introduce them to their ways of life. Because usually that's not going too well for the locals, as we all know. Because, of course, one of the earliest populations of farmers in the entire world had to be taught how to farm by those who were better than them, as the Anatolian people weren't capable themselves, according to Graham. Yes, this is quite offensive to the Anatolian people, and one of the reasons archaeologists dislike Graham's narrative. Graham then brings up the local lore of Mesopotamia. Well, the Mesopotamian deluge tradition, I should say which is, of course, thousands of years younger than the creation of Gobekli Tepe and the other Tastapeller sites. Of course, you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the most well-known of the Mesopotamian lores. I went to look into the flood myths of Mesopotamia, I found the flood myth portion in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and I did find a bit of info on the Apkalu that Graham mentions. The Apkalu demigods he mentions were considered to be humans after the deluge and they are often described as part man and part fish, or the body of a man and the head of a bird or another animal. So I was really annoyed when Graham said that the Apkalu were traditionally depicted as bearded figurines in flowing robes who instructed the survivors of the Great Flood. Nowhere was I able to find one mention of the Apkalu as bearded figurines in robes. I don't know where Graham got this bit of supposed information from, but his sources are very untrustworthy when it comes to this portion. He then does mention the leader of the Apkalu named Oannes was said to have come from the sea and was part fish and part man. They all were. So he says that Oannes walked among the people, teaching them agriculture, architecture and knowledge of the stars. Nowhere was I able to find any of this information. It feels like Graham is just saying this in the hopes of proving his point, even though his arguments here are based on nothing substantial. You can't say a myth said this, and then it turns out that the myth you are referring to never spoke about the things you said it did. It looks incredibly bad, and it makes a viewer like me, with a critical eye of your Netflix show, quite annoyed. 
Especially because this isn't actually the first time he is adding his own spin to a myth that he's referring to. Of course, to Graham, Oannes is yet another example of a civilizing hero, a teacher that came out of nowhere after a big flood, that taught the people the ways of civilization, a civilizing hero that taught the people in the area how to create Gobekli Tepe, because without this hero, the Tastapelar sites would have never been created as the local population, in his mind, weren't capable of doing it themselves. You see how that sounds bad? He then shifts his focus for a short moment on the depictions in the arts of all these different civilizations across the globe and how it's all remarkably similar. He mentions their handbags and I highly recommend watching these three videos with Dr. David Miano on the ancient handbags, which I will link in the description down below for you to watch. This video is actually already getting way too long for me to go into every detail myself, but I know that Dr. David Miano from the World of Antiquity YouTube channel does a fantastic job explaining what they are. He then goes back to that serious connection that he conjured up in the Malta episode and how, according to him, the same phenomenon can be seen at Gobekli Tepe, which to him is another hint that the ancient builders in both Malta and Turkey had access to a pool of shared knowledge concerning astronomy and megalithic construction. Which I find a ludicrous statement because the serious connection that he is referring to in Malta isn't accepted by archaeologists because it's not proven as the temples have been dated to be far younger than Graham would like his viewers to think. Because he wants his viewers to believe in his ancient advanced lost civilization who traveled the world at the end of the last ice age and taught humanity how to do all of this because they were so advanced while the rest of the world were still dumb hunter-gatherers that had to be taught everything instead of figuring things out on their own. I don't know why. He then brings on Martin Sweatman in the episode, who is a statistical mechanic in chemical engineering. Not a scholar in the field of archaeology, and I would like to direct you, my viewers, to this incredibly detailed and long video by Dr. David Miano on the World of Antiquity YouTube channel about the misinformation that Martin Sweatman has spread about Gobekli Tepe. Dr. David Miano is a respected historian who thankfully is growing quite fast here on YouTube in the past year. I very much enjoy his work and his thoroughness and I hope that he will get way more subscribers as time goes on because he absolutely deserves it. He does incredible work. But to quickly look at the episode, according to Martin Sweatman, Pillar 43, also known as the Vulture Stone, is the most important here at Gobekli Tepe in Enclosure D. He even equates it to the Rosetta Stone because he believes that the symbols on the stone might represent asterisms, which are figures that are meant to depict bright star clusters in the night sky. To give an example of this, Sweatman points out the scorpion on the stone and says that this refers to Scorpius in the night sky. This is something that's not accepted nor confirmed by archaeologists who have extensively researched the site and Pillar 43. Of course, according to Graham, it's a bonus that we can see at least one asterism on the stone that we recognize because many cultures have given different names and figures to the constellations of the zodiac. So, according to Sweatman, above Scorpius we would expect Sagittarius, which you know is the archer with the bow and arrow in our modern zodiac, but according to him, the vulture depicts it on Pillar 43, has its wings in a perfect angle to represent the bow and arrow. Which honestly is such a massive stretch and far-fetched theory, it sounds completely made up to me as the viewer. I actually like snorted laughing when I saw that portion of the episode, I'm sorry. But Graham continues the theory by showing the stars around the zodiac of Scorpius in the night sky and how the other depicted animals fit these stars perfectly and I have to absolutely disagree here. This is making things fit that you want to fit instead of it scientifically being proven to fit in any way, shape or form. This is the same thing that happens when we see human faces in like a rock or something. Sometimes you just see what it is that you want to see. Sweatman believes that the central circle depicted on Pillar 43 is the Sun and that by looking at the constellations that he believes are depicted on the stone around the sun, you can try to come up with a date. Because he believes that Pillar 43 is essentially a date stamp. 
He is of the belief that the top of Pillar 43 is not showing three handbags, as many alternative historians have proposed, but that they are three sunsets. They then jump to the conclusion that these three sunsets depicted here are representing key moments in a solar year. The summer solstice, the winter solstice, and the spring and fall equinoxes, although these are four key moments in a year, not three. The equinoxes were equally as important to the ancient people as the solstices, because many structures have been created to align with equinox sunrises or sunsets. The jumping to conclusions and then taking these jumps as fact in this show is just mind-boggling to me. Of course, Graham then wonders to what date the stone is referring and he uses his software again from the Malta episode, which I wasn't a fan of. I had many people in my comments saying it's quite accurate, it's not completely 100% scientifically proven. And of course they find a precise 100 year window that perfectly fits Martin's theory around 10,900 to 10,800 BCE, even though Gobekli Tepe is dated, and this particular stone is dated, which is more than a thousand years before construction started on the enclosures that have been excavated at Gobekli Tepe, and I'll repeat here, of which only 5% is excavated, and older enclosures may very well exist. And of course, Martin brings up the Younger Dryas, a climate event in which the world cooled down, back into a short ice age that lasted for a thousand years, approximately. This is what Graham is referring to when he speaks of the ancient apocalypse, Although scientists simply call it the Younger Dryas, it has to do with a flower that normally grows in very cold places that started to grow in Europe where it's normally warm. There are multiple events that actually happened leading up to the start of the Younger Dryas and multiple events that happened at the end of it. Events like volcanoes erupting in Europe, massive ice dams breaking, changing the conveyor belt of the Atlantic Ocean, you can Google that, which has a massive effect on the climate in the entire world, just to give you an example. Graham makes it sound like all of this happened overnight. A global cataclysm with massive floods before a thousand years of reverting back into an ice age and then another flood. That this changed life on Earth fundamentally, that mammoths and saber-toothed tigers went extinct during this cold spell. Although, <laughs> I found that mammoths went extinct at the latest around 8000 BCE, and they even survived in some places in Alaska and Russia. 1600 years after the creation of Gobekli Tepe, 8000 BCE, I might add. Saber-toothed tigers went extinct between 8000 and 6000 BCE, which is even later. Both species survived the Younger Dryas, so why he's saying they didn't actually strikes me as quite odd. He then says that the Younger Dryas ended with a final and immense flood, which I already explained in my review of episode 1, is not exactly what happened, as sea level rise happened quite gradually. He has been fitting so much of the proposed conclusions in this show to his theory, that of course, according to him, work on Gobekli Tepe could not have started before 11,600 years ago as his fabled lost civilization hadn't arrived yet as their home of Atlantis wasn't destroyed yet before this cataclysmic event. Even though Bonkuklu Tarla exists and is at least a thousand years older than Gobekli Tepe and shows the skill set that these people had, this is where I personally, me, hope that they continue the excavations at Gobekli Tepe and that they find an enclosure that predates the current excavated ones by a couple hundred or maybe even a thousand years because it would immediately silence Graham and his proposed theory here at Gobekli Tepe, showing that they, the Anatolian people, did in fact create these incredible structures themselves gradually over time. Before the episode ends, Graham makes a last remark about Gobekli Tepe as he says that it was intentionally buried suddenly and rapidly around 8000 BCE. He says that there must have been teams of hundreds of people that were burying Gobekli Tepe. 
He says Gobekli Tepe wasn't abandoned, it wasn't destroyed or looted, but it was carefully buried, hidden away and preserved. Even though there is absolutely no evidence pointing to Gobekli Tepe ever being intentionally buried by humans, although it was indeed buried over time by sediment. So at the very end of the episode, according to Graham, Gobekli Tepe should be perceived as a time capsule with a message for later civilizations. He then starts talking about the serpent depictions at Gobekli Tepe, the serpent-like shapes at Karahan Tepe, the fact that Quetzalcoatl, the god in Mexico and the pyramids there, was often depicted as a serpent and that at Gigantia you have to step over a threshold with the carving of a serpent and that this connects all of these sites but the best example of the serpent is found in Ohio at Serpent Mount where he goes to in the next episode. Well, goes to... He's not really allowed to film there for the show because the historians and the archaeologists and the people working there do not agree with his theory that the Serpent Mound is older than what science has told us, because Graham believes that it is older, and all of that we will discuss in the next episode, review of Ancient Apocalypse. I mean, oof. I would like to quickly mention though that Graham never mentions the discovered carved skull fragments that were found at Gobekli Tepe. They were carved and defleshed by the use of flint back in ancient times. I mean, that's a stone tool used to carve into a skull for whatever reasons they felt necessary. Might be ritualistic or religious, we don't know. But he left that information out and I found that a bit strange because these skulls are dated. But with that last bit of information, you have finally reached the end of this video. I salute you for watching me for this long today. Thank you so much for your time. and. If you enjoyed watching, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you'd like to see more of these kind of videos, and click that bell icon if you want to be notified whenever I upload. If you haven't seen my previous videos yet, then click the card in the upper right corner, or click one of the links in the description down below, or you can click a video or playlist in the end card. I would like to say a massive, massive thank you to all my patrons and my channel members. Thank you so much for supporting me. I know I'm not the greatest at posting, on Patreon or posting here for my channel members. I'm actually really bad at posting altogether besides my videos. I'll try and work on it. I can't make any promises I can't keep, sorry. I'll do my best, but thank you so much for supporting me. And with this said, I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.